Well, uh, good day, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Zaid, founder and CEO at GetAround. For those that don't know us or the company, we are a connected car sharing marketplace where you can instantly access and drive cars shared by people nearby using just your phone. Uh, today, we have about 6 million users sharing 100,000 cars across 300 cities in the US and Europe. Um, I want to start off by saying I'm so excited to participate in InventionCon and speak to so many inventors, entrepreneurs, and intellectual property professionals. Um, so thank you to the US Patent and Trademark Office for inviting me to join you today to share 10 lessons in innovation and entrepreneurship. When I was asked to give the speech, I figured I should begin with my own entrepreneurial journey. So I asked myself, what is it that got me interested in inventing new things, in building products, and in entrepreneurial innovation? After thinking about it, reflecting on it, I realized it all started with computers and video games. Like many kids growing up in the 80s and 90s, I played video games when I was younger. Probably too many video games. But it was when I started playing online MUDs and Moos, which are multi-user domains on my Macintosh, that I first got an early taste for building and creating new things. Um, so Moos or MUDs, which are multi-user domains back then were text only virtual worlds where players could build new artifacts and objects using native programming languages. So as a kid, you can imagine being able to create new objects in this world, even though it was a virtual world, was fascinating. Um, that led me down a path of reading every book and learning everything I could about programming languages from Pascal to C to assembly. And along the way, I also became really fascinated by the demo scene, by the PC Amiga demo scene, which was back then also an international computer art subculture where people would create these stunning audiovisual presentations. Well, they were stunning for, for the time anyway, that showed off programming and visual art and musical skills. In the photo, you can actually see me and my younger brother on our Apple Macintosh. He actually doesn't seem super happy with the situation, probably because I was hogging the computer, um, which would not be uncommon. Anyway, before long, I became obsessed with a PC game called Dune, which was based off the Frank Herbert sci-fi novel. I was convinced and convinced a few of my friends that a multiplayer version of a real-time strategy game like Dune would be an amazing, I mean, amazing game to play. And since it didn't exist, who better to create it than us? So we put nights and weekends into it, teaching ourselves how to build video games. In reality, we had neither the programming experience nor the math skills required to actually succeed. Um, but we were learning, learning rapidly and having a bunch of fun along the way. Ultimately, we failed. We never did ship that video game, but a then small unknown company called Blizzard Entertainment did ship a multiplayer RTS game set in a fantasy world. That game was Warcraft, which actually went on to become one of the most successful video game franchises ever, and a game that I put way too many hours into myself. But despite never actually shipping our multiplayer RTS, all those years hacking on computers did land me an internship position as a computer programmer at Nortel uh, when I was 15 years old. And what I learned there and that experience helped me to understand the business behind technology. Um, in fact, several of my managers had filed dozens of patents and, and that really instilled in me the value of intellectual property and real deep tech as a competitive advantage. So by the time I entered college in my home country of Canada, I had developed a passion for entrepreneurship and I was eager to start my own company. Actually, right out of school, I co-founded my first internet company, which we called Nintari, which is an intermingling of the names Nintendo and Atari, Nintendo and Atari, and yes, it was about video games. Um, it was in fact an online marketplace, much like GetAround is an online marketplace for connecting with other people to trade video games and trade DVDs. Um, as you can see, it's a very web 1.0 website. Uh, you know, I wouldn't build something that looks like this today, but we worked at it for almost three years, uh, but we didn't make it. We actually failed at that too. 
but not long, not long after picked ourselves back up, I founded Option a Software Consultant called Consultancy Leveraging artificial intelligence and big data to solve complex business challenges. Uh, when both AI and big data and cloud computing generally were, were far less ubiquitous than they are today. And actually some of the team from Nintari joined me and compete while we were competing against much larger companies and we didn't have the same brand recognition or credibility, we did have more innovative technology. My first patent actually covered a mail routing and sorting approach that Canada Post used to sort and manage its letter mail. Um, as we built the company, we were able to attract other customers by leaning on our technology and our IP. And believe it or not, the company is still in business many years later. And this is the first lesson I'd like to share because it is one of the most important lessons to learn in becoming an entrepreneur or an inventor. And that is that failure is part of the journey. Now, I'm not saying failure is fun. It's not. It's painful. It can be strenuous. It's not fun at all. But it's a stopover on every journey that's worth making. Now, I would talk about all the challenges I've experienced as an, in my entrepreneurial journey as an entrepreneur and inventor. But the US PTO told me strictly the session had to end before midnight. So let's fast forward to 2009. I learned about a new program in Silicon Valley called Singularity University. Far from a traditional university, Singularity offered accelerated graduate studies, executive education programs, an incubator, a consultancy, all of this focused on developing innovative solutions to humanity's greatest challenges. Started by Peter Diamantis, founder of the XPRIZE, Ray Kurzweil, a prolific inventor, and then the MIT chair in artificial intelligence, and with the help of Larry Page, one of Google's co-founders, it featured really the who's who of Silicon Valley. I had the privilege of being part of the inaugural graduate studies program, a class of 40 students, along with a very close friend of mine who became my co-founder, Jessica Scorpio. At Singularity, Google co-founder Larry Page challenged us to come up with an idea that would positively impact a billion people in 10 years. I was blown away. Up to that point, investors and advisors had always encouraged a focus on incremental innovation and ideas that had a very clear path to revenue and monetization. You know, to innovate only if it could pay off very quickly. Um, and that was the first thing that struck me in coming to Silicon Valley. And that spirit still exists today, which is a belief that entrepreneurs can and should focus on making transformative impact on society. That it's good to chase dreams and it's good to think differently. Of course, Silicon Valley doesn't have a monopoly on big dreams, but it was a sea change in my environment and my thinking at the time. When Jessica and I arrived at Singularity, we brought, we brought with us a passion for entrepreneurship and openness to learn new things and explore what, if anything, we might create. Once we heard Larry's challenge, we were mobilized. We quickly decided that we should focus our efforts on transportation because transportation affects everybody, almost everyone every day. And as we looked into transportation, we realized the world suffered a massive challenge, a problem we came to call car overpopulation. We discovered that we waste 30 billion car hours every day. On average, more than a billion cars sit unused for 22 hours each day. And most people who own those cars, they rarely use them. And the people who need a car to perform a critical task of life often cannot afford to own one. So we decided to focus on solving the car overpopulation problem, as we called it, by ushering in a new era of sharing personal cars. In other words, car owners could share the cars they owned with people who needed a car or perhaps didn't have access to the right type of car for a particular type of trip. But this problem, I mean, this problem of car population, it wasn't new. It has existed and has worsened, in fact, for decades. We had to ask ourselves then, was there new technology? Was there something different now that would disrupt the status quo? 
it was actually 2009 when we were, we were at Singularity and we drew this plot. We saw that the smartphone and namely the iPhone at the time and mobile data, they were growing exponentially. And this would create ubiquitous connectivity and accurate location data in the hands and pockets of consumers. We were convinced that the next wave, um, the next wave after the smartphone would be connectivity and data transforming the personal automobile, AKA the connected car, and then following that, AI and computing power increasing and sensors would drive yet a third wave of, of transformation of technology in transportation, a third wave of autonomous transformation of the personal automobile. And that's the second lesson of innovation and entrepreneurship I'd like to share. Answering the question, why now? Because the biggest challenge is when a market is the biggest challenge, the biggest changes, I should say, and the biggest opportunities occur when a market is disrupted by a fast growing new technology. That shakeup creates a window of opportunity for inventors and entrepreneurs to use that momentum to their advantage. That's because most big companies will resist change and new technologies inevitably create a lot of change. As we were starting to get around, we now had one, we had a massive global problem, car overpopulation, and two, a wave, multiple waves of exponential disruption driven by technology that we believed were on the horizon. This then led to the conviction and the foundational belief that now was the right time to launch Getaround. If you've ever been surfing, that meant we needed to be out in the water, ready to catch the waves, as they arrived and when they were arriving, which leads to a closely related third lesson of innovation and entrepreneurship, get in the water. As an innovator, as best you can, you wanna identify and ride one or more technology waves. The challenge is you can't know for sure exactly when a wave is coming, which means it's most crucial to be in the water so that you can catch the wave you believe is coming when it arrives. Now it may not, arrive when you expect it entirely, may come sooner or later. But I learned this lesson in my first two startups. If a technology wave is coming and you're in the water, you're much better positioned to catch it and try to ride it. And don't get me wrong, um, you will still take a lot of hard work, focus, skilled execution, a little bit of luck, but you will have exponentially growing momentum on your side. So you need to prepare for the wave, even if, it's met, you're met with skepticism and position the company to catch it when it arrives. With Get Around, the first wave we wanted to catch was the smartphone. We believed the smartphone would become so ubiquitous that it would replace your car keys. The phone, and more specifically the Get Around app, should be all you need to access a car. This conviction is why early on we built the Get Around product when we were making those design choices, we deliberately chose not to support any other form of access. So no key fob, no access card. Our belief was all you needed was your phone. And we held to that belief that the smartphone would become so embedded in our lives that we wouldn't need to support any other form of keyless entry technology. Even though back in 2009, that might've sounded crazy to a lot of people that maybe doesn't today, that we, those foundational beliefs are what allowed us to design and orient the company in a way that aligned with the, the, the waves of technology that were coming. In the photo, you're actually looking at the first prototype of our connected hardware with, with you can see in the top left, uh, actually a, a Blackberry, nobody has those anymore. And um, we actually, this was, I think our, our first prototype, we built it in two weeks, it obviously is very janky, but it worked and actually Bluetooth from a uh, BlackBerry and unlocked our first uh, first car unlocked with our technology, which was instantly a to Toyota Sienna because my VP of hardware owned a Toyota Sienna, Sienna for his family. Our second wave is the connected car. We believe that every car will soon have rich internet connectivity and real-time data access built in by the car manufacturer with apps replacing car keys. 
Now, what's interesting is we say that, but it's been 10 years that we've held this belief, and that wave has yet to arrive. But it's starting now. This is why we built, along the way, we built our own connected car hardware and software infrastructure. We decided early on that we needed to take the lead and start the paradigm shift to build technology ourselves that enabled a connected sharing experience through seamlessly integrated hardware, software, and services. But we've literally been out in the water for 10 years, building our IP, our technology, and expertise in connected cars, waiting for that industry wave to arrive. A question I'm often asked by entrepreneurs who've decided to get in the water is then, how do I find customers and how do I grow my business? And it can always, especially early on, can seem like the most daunting of tasks. My, my fourth lesson of innovation and entrepreneurship is to partition in powers of 10. The first partition is to win over the 10 to the power zero customer, AKA your first customer. The second partition is to win over your first 10 customers, 10 to the power one, and then your first hundred customers, and then your first thousand customers. Focus on each discrete step at a time, and the challenge all of a sudden becomes much more manageable. You'll also probably quickly realize that what works for your first 10 customers won't work for your first 1,000 customers, but that's okay. That's okay, and it's normal. The mistake is trying to figure out all of this stuff at once, um, and that itself can just be overwhelming, and you don't have the information to do it. Because after the first 10 customers, you'll have much more data, much more intuition about how to reach 100 customers. And after you reach 100 customers, they'll have much more data and intuition about how to reach 1,000 customers and so on. In other words, make sure your product or service works in a micro level with fewer customers in a smaller area before you scale. With GetAround, our first step was to develop a proof of concept. And we did that leveraging our Singularity classmates. So we started by asking them, you know, would they want to share their car? And the initial feedback wasn't promising. One person called us crazy. Another said they would never let a stranger take their car. And yet another said, I wouldn't share my, I wouldn't share, even share my car with my spouse. But we kept our, to our conviction that once they tried it, they would like it. So we started with one student sharing one car and then convinced 10 students to use the service. Of course, the process looked like very different from get around of today. Everything was manual. There was no smartphone app or hardware installed in the car. Users texted each other to meet up and exchange keys in person. Honestly, it was really an MVP, a non-viable product. Um, but it proved that people actually saw value. And as we hoped, when students on the Singularity campus located at the NASA Ames Research Center started using the service, they loved it. Many of the students did not have access to a car or they didn't have their car with them. So it was really useful. And they took advantage of the service to run errands, to grab a coffee, to go shopping. And as fellow inventors and entrepreneurs and technologists, they were also eager and excited to provide feedback and suggest improvements. And trust me, there were a lot of improvements to suggest. And so while we had an idea that worked reasonably well with our classmates in one car, we had no technology and we had no business. We knew that we needed an app to enable users to find and book the car and in conjunction with a hardware device inside the car to unlock it, to unlock and drive it. So Jessica and I went to an iPhone hackathon and that's where we met our third co-founder, Elliot Crow. After about a year of lobbying him and getting him to do part-time work, Elliot joined the team full-time as our chief technology officer which is a role he still holds today. And that brings me to my fifth lesson. Surround yourself with complementary, complementary with an E, and exceptional people. From your co-founders, employees, to investors, mentors, your at-home support network. Our success, GetAround's initial success, was due largely to the diverse experiences and strengths of the founding and early team. I was a technology entrepreneur who had business and entrepreneurial experience, as well as engineering experience. Jessica was our marketer with a lot of heart and a lot of hustle. And Elliot was a technologist through and through. It would have been hard for us 
just one of us or two of us to execute on something as ambitious, this ambitious as get around. But we, so we needed a blend of deep tech experience of business savvy, marketing expertise and gusto to launch the company. Now, as you bring on more people, obviously it can be difficult to maintain that level of talent and mix of talent, but it remains really important. And one of the things we did very well, I, I think we was something that was very difficult to, to maintain throughout was very much a focus on innovation and technology first. In fact, we filed two provisional patent applications even before we filed our articles of incorporation. And the technology covered in those applications formed the basis of our product development and our technical North Star, including our strategy of building a smartphone-based access and connected sharing system. What's funny is that even though we knew we filed patents and we knew connected sharing was the future, what did we do? We actually launched unconnected without hardware at first. We realized that we needed, we also realized that we needed to get a product out there that to build consumer awareness and learn about the business model, we had to be in the market, even if we didn't have the perfect product. We were building enabling technology, but we also needed to show traction and we needed to build a business. And that was a real conundrum. And frankly, to be honest, no one was going to give us funding for years of hardware and platform R&D so that maybe one day, maybe people would share cars. That was a, that was a tricky path to navigate, um, but I think it underscores the lesson there, that there is a careful balance, balance between how much you try to perfect your product versus getting something to market and learning what customers want. And that gets to my sixth lesson of innovation and entrepreneurship, which is be ready to hustle. Innovation is naturally messy and it's rarely a linear path. Sometimes you have to launch before your technology is fully developed. And in our case, that's what we had to do. And in fact, we did that on a national stage at TechCrunch Disrupt, TechCrunch Disrupt in New York City. And we did that after a year of product development and only a few months of beta testing. Back then, TechCrunch Disrupt was, and maybe still is, the biggest startup launch competition globally. It was 30 plus startup pitching their hearts out in front of a live audience of a few thousand people with pitches streamed over the internet and a panel of tech celebrity judges from, from people like Marissa Mayer to Ashton Kutcher. What's sort of ironic is we weren't even one of the, the 30 original companies selected to present. We were a plus one. We had managed to hustle our way into the competition after all other presenters were selected by contacting the organizers and convincing them that we deserve to pitch. In fact, it was so last minute that it was only a few weeks before the competition kicked off in New York. Not only that, then we had to manage to convince TechCrunch to let us ship a Tesla Roadster to the competition so that we could demo our product live. And since we actually had to ship the car from San Francisco, we then convinced Tesla to help us ship our Roadster from San Francisco to New York, arriving with just one day to spare before our presentation. After two days of intense competition against great companies, really smart people with great ideas, and against all odds, we ended up winning both the judged startup battlefield pitch competition by unanimous decision and the audience choice award. And instantly we went from being an unknown startup to being covered by Bloomberg, CNN, Forbes, and dozens of other media outlets the very next day. Now, the thing is, TC Disrupt wants you to officially launch at the event. And if you win, you really have to launch because there are so many eyes on you. So our win meant we had to really formally launch, even though we weren't really ready. Talk about an oh crap moment. Overnight, everyone knew about us. And this recognition launched us into new territory. You know, our idea had been validated by one of the foremost tech publications in the world. And almost instantly, thousands of people were starting to sign up, wanting to share their cars, list on our platform. We wanted to capitalize on this moment and build on the success of our initial beta test. The thing is, we just weren't ready. And you can guess what happened next. We had problems with people downloading the app, the app crashing, 
people wanting to rent a car, but not having cars in their area. The website being just unable to keep up with the sheer volume of traffic. And, you know, our inbox is flooded with emails. But we had to keep with the hustle. Now with the world watching us, um, you can see in the photo myself and Jessica at the Bloomberg office in NYC, but we managed. And we just put our heads down and hustled really hard to, to fix everything, to get going and make the best of the situation. And we did. And speaking of hustle, nobody had more hustle, more heart than my co-founder, Jessica. I mean, she memorized, we got a lot of customers coming in and she memorized the names and knew everything about our first thousand customers. She put in so much extra effort to make sure they were successful one booking at a time. It certainly wasn't scalable and not something you do forever, but for that power of 10 partition, those first thousand customers, it was totally the right thing to do. And I'd advise any startup to do the same. Our overnight success at TechCrunch Disrupt also meant no more flying under the radar. Regulators were starting to take notice and we had to choose whether to engage proactively with cities and governments or not. And that gets to my seventh lesson, particularly if you're operating in a space that is or will be regulated, is to take a seat at the table. And what I mean is being an early, proactive, and active part of the conversation about public policy in your space, if you need to do that. Connected car sharing, get around style, peer-to-peer -peer was something entirely new. We didn't fit in the same box as traditional car rental cars or traditional car sharing operators that own vehicles. There was no statutory or regulatory regime about how we needed to operate. There were no insurance guidelines or existing auto insurance products to assure our customers they would be protected. In, the, in fact, in the beginning, I'd say that the insurance industry was completely wary of what we were doing. We made well over 100 calls, cold calls, to insurance companies, to VPs of products inside of large carriers. We asked for help from every influential contact in our network that we could think of, but we could not get anyone, I mean, I mean no one, to provide insurance for renting someone else's car. Interestingly, it was actually working with legislators that cracked the code on insurance. By advocating for a new insurance bill in our home state of California on personal vehicle sharing, we were able to secure our first insurance partner, Berkshire Hathaway. And it was important to have insurance coverage during a get around trip that was provided by the platform rather than relying on the car owner's coverage. It was equally important that the owner's insurance for their, the use of their car wouldn't be canceled just because they were sharing it on our platform. So by passing a law, it gave early adopters confidence to use get around and showed insurance companies that we were serious about being a sustainable business that worked with and not against lawmakers, regulators, and community leaders. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, and some entrepreneurs are hostile to the possibility of government interest in what they're doing or potential regulation. And I understand that. It's just, for us, we learned early on though, that taking a seat at the table and working with government was going to be important in launching our new model. Crafting a new regulatory framework collaboratively with the appropriate legislative bodies is what unlocked insurance, as I mentioned, and it's what allowed us to get the coverage we needed for cars, owners and drivers, and third parties during the time a car was shared. And ever since we've learned that lesson, we've aimed to be a collaborative partner with governments, whether it's state governments considering car sharing or insurance legislation and regulation, or local governments supporting car sharing by providing incentives for residents, or otherwise allocating low or no cost parking spaces for shared cars. We, we felt that working collaboratively within the public policy sphere has only helped get around grow and is in fact, by being proactive, has helped us grow faster. To give a few examples, um, recently we partnered with the third largest public transportation department in the United States, the LA County MTA, to help convert metro stations into mobility hubs for car sharing, micro mobility, and other transportation options. Um, and, and while that's an example, obviously a large, LA being a large city, we're not just helping large urban areas either. Take the city of Salem, located one hour outside of Boston. With a population of 40,000, surprisingly even Salem suffers from congestion problems due to car overpopulation. 
Actually, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be launching vehicles throughout Salem in partnership with the city. Additionally, in San Francisco, we were part of the original pilot to reserve curb space for car share vehicles to promote consumer adoption. There's a lot of great examples of working collaboratively with governments and cities. Anyway, shortly after we, the success of passing the bill and around the time of TechCrunch Disrupt, we closed our $3 million seed round and quickly raised another $10 million in our Series A. We finally had the capital required to fund our product and technology vision and set our sights on expanding into other cities. Now, Get Around was doing well in the Bay Area, and our, our, frankly, our investors were hungry for more. Despite, you know, but despite the pressure for growth and expansion at the time, we resisted the urge to, to burn our early funding on aggressive expansion nationally. Although we did expand selectively into Portland, into Chicago, Austin, and San Diego throughout 2012. Of course, we still hadn't actually built or launched our connected hardware and software technology. People were sharing cars on Get Around, sure, but they were doing so by meeting up in person and handing off physical car keys. This wasn't our vision. We had one major hurdle remaining before we could make Get Around's vision, or, I, mean, I mean, our full vision of car sharing a reality. We had to finish and ship our Get Around Connect hardware and software technology that would power instant mobile first connected car sharing. You can see in the photo of our lab bench, the Connect printed circuit boards are on the right there, just below the the uh, oscilloscope, and we had to, you know, we had to really build this hardware technology. The problem was that with our small team. We found it very difficult to split our attention between focusing on growing multiple markets, San Francisco, Chicago, Portland, Austin, and San Diego at the time, while also realizing our technology vision. And we still hadn't proven product market fit for our connected model in our home market of San Francisco. We knew, I mean, in we believed we had super strong conviction that we knew that digitizing access was the key to unlocking the potential of sharing cars. And that without it, you'd have to meet someone in person to get a physical key, which really limits the driver's access to the car and is a total disincentive for the owner to share their car. Um, and technology, I mean, technology was the key to make get around car sharing experience feel like magic. Waiting at a counter or having to coordinate schedules to hand over a key, that's not magic. Downloading an app, instantly signing up, getting approved and renting a car walking up to the BMW you just rented nearby, tapping unlock, unlock in the Get Around app and having the car unlock in 100 milliseconds or less and making that work seamlessly on thousands of cars, thousands of makes and models, that, that was the magic we wanted to deliver for customers. So we made a very tough call. We actually decided to halt all expansion and focus on realizing our long-term vision only in San Francisco. That meant losing revenue while we focused on the product and technology. It's not the easiest pitch to sell investors on. Keep in mind that this was a time when mobility was fast expanding, mobility companies were in land grab mode, expanding as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And here we were telling investors, yeah, no, we're just gonna focus on a small part of the greater Bay Area and get the product right. We actually spent the next two years focused on achieving product market fit in just San Francisco, refining our business model, understanding our unit economics, tweaking the operating dynamics, the marketplace dynamics. And in 2014, after launching the second generation of our hardware, which you see on the screen here, we made the decision to fully sunset the unconnected model at the end of that same year. And it wouldn't be until 2015 that we started expanding again, but this time with a refined product and field proven technology that matched our vision. In retrospect, we should have focused on getting things right in San Francisco before expanding to a third or second or third market, which gets to the eighth lesson of innovation and entrepreneurship I'd like to share. Always remember Polaris, your North Star. As innovators and entrepreneurs, we all face difficult choices, and it can be very hard to think long-term in the heat of the battle. 
there's so many short-term pressures. And in those times, having a clear North Star, a clear vision and mission for the company is extremely helpful in guiding you to make the hard strategic choices in the long-term interests of the company, especially in the darker times. As we started expanding again in 2015, we had developed the product and technology, we would secured the funding, but we weren't done. How are we going to equip our technology into an owner's car that was ready to be shared, whether it's in Los Angeles, Miami, Boston, Chicago, or Denver? And that brings us to lesson nine, integrate an ecosystem. Figuring out distribution of our Get Around Connect technology was, was key to our expansion. Though we engineer our technology to work with thousands of makes and models, the installation from varied from car to car and required some automotive tech skills. And for reasons of security and anti-theft, we wanted the technology to be professionally installed. The good news is in almost any industry, there will be an established value chain and ecosystem. And while we could have hired and trained our own technicians, we instead set up an online certification and virtual training program built by our in-house auto tech team. As we brought, then as we brought local operations teams that knew their cities inside out, they would visit small and medium-sized car shops and businesses in their markets. They pitched them on becoming Get Around certified installers and asked if they were willing to sign on. And lo and behold, within weeks, we had built a distributed network of install partners in each market. Even more positive was Get Around was now part of the community, part of the ecosystem. And out of it, we got a steady flow of cars onboarded to the platform. But we also got expert partners giving us feedback on our technology and helping us improve. And they got, those small business partners got steady business with training and phone support from our, from our internal auto tech team. Similarly, we worked with the ecosystem of parking operators in each city, both private and public, referring them business when our customers need parking spaces. In turn, we get negotiate favorable pricing for our car owners, and we get free branding at those locations to boot. So through all the setbacks, opportunities, and challenges in our path, we have learned and lived the power of perseverance and focus. My 10th lesson of innovation and entrepreneurship is to practice mental models and thinking tools. As I've learned, the journey of an entrepreneur and inventor can be long and can be perilous. Mental models and thinking tools helped me focus, to deal with uncertainty, and to work through challenges. And there are many, many of these, and mastery would probably take a lifetime, but a few methodologies that I find useful are computational systems and design thinking. For example, uh, the principle of decomposition from computational thinking can be extremely powerful when building a company. It's often near impossible to think about everything at once, and even harder to do it when there's a ton of uncertainty in front of you. But decomposing a complex work product into constituent parts makes it much easier to focus on each step at a time. Now, in contrast, systems thinking is really about the whole and the interaction between the parts. You think about the system holistically, end to end. And for example, you know, if, and there are many examples of this. So for example, transportation and urban mobility is a systems problem. A company, you know, an organization of people is similarly a systems problem. In each of these cases, thinking about the system holistically can be very, very helpful to optimizing the end-to-end -end objective set. Another area of applicability is raising venture capital. The first thing you realize is that investors are sharp and efficient pattern matching machines. But if you understand the mental models and patterns they use, you can better fit your pitch to the success patterns they seek out. And that can help you raise money and help you, you know, take your, get your product to market. So in any domain, there are accepted mental models and thinking tools that can help and learning them can just make you much more effective. And then learning a diverse set of them allows you to understand what tool to use when, uh, no matter what sort of situation is thrown your way. Now, a very recent example we've all been living, I mean, we've been living and all of us have been living, for the past few months is COVID-19. When 2020 started, we envisioned another strong year of growth for Getter. We never, I mean, never, never imagined that a global pandemic would keep hundreds of millions of people in their homes and disrupt mobility around the world. 
I mean, like others, when the pandemic hit, we saw a sudden and steep decline in our business. And we needed to rapidly deploy many of the lessons of innovation and entrepreneurship and through extremely uncertain times. Decomposition, pattern matching, thinking from first principles, inversion thinking. We had to use every tool in the toolbox to get by day to day and week to week. I like to say and tell the team, you know, that in 2020, we made a thousand critical, critical decisions in less than a hundred days. Thankfully, the business has since rebounded. This was covered in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. And car sharing has become an essential service as we work through the pandemic, as people are flying less and using other modes of transportation just less. The actual headwinds, the headwinds of COVID have become tailwinds position us, positioning us for growth. And what a lesson that was. A decade ago, my co-founders and I committed to helping solve the problem of car overpopulation. While we certainly haven't solved it yet, there's no doubt in my mind that sharing cars is a critical part of that solution. And along the way, we've learned that one shared car can replace 10. Half of the car share users sell their car or forgo purchasing one. Car sharing instead of owning your own car makes it more likely that you'll you won't drive that at all, that you'll walk, you'll carpool, you'll ride a bike, take a scooter, hop on a skateboard, or use public transportation more often. And actually what we find in the data is by car sharing, households reduce their annual greenhouse gas emissions by up to 41%. Yet there are still over 1 million cars in the world today. But let's just imagine, imagine for one moment if just 10 million of those billion plus cars were shared. That's less than 1% of the cars out there today. That would mean 100 million fewer cars on the road, 1 trillion pounds of CO2 eliminated, improved air quality and open city streets, parking turned into extra playgrounds, parks and public spaces. In some cities today, like San Francisco, Paris, Oslo and Los Angeles, car sharing is already ubiquitous. As more cars are connected and as cars become self-driving, fewer people will need to own cars for their exclusive use. And as technology advances and sharing becomes easier, it creates a virtuous cycle for people and communities across the globe to once and for all solve car overpopulation. At Get Around, we believe that in the not too distant future, we'll take car sharing of personal vehicles for granted. Perhaps in ways we have yet to even contemplate. So in many ways, my journey has been unique, but in many respects, it's every entrepreneur's journey. Centered around solving a problem, never a straight path. As the world faces increasingly daunting challenges every day, it's up to us, it's up to all of you, the inventors, the innovators, the entrepreneurs to lead the way, to build, to execute, fail, iterate, learn, improve. It's this, is our calling and this is what needs to, we need to do. So I wanna close out by just saying, it's really been an honor. I mean, a true honor speaking at the conference hosted by the Patent and Trademark Office, America's innovation agency. And whichever way the road takes you, I wish you health, safety, and much continued success. Thank you very much. Tim, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, and we don't have a ton of time, uh, but uh, I will get into them. Just to confirm, Sam, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great, excellent. Ah, first question. Did you ever consider giving up? <laughs> um, probably many times. Um, you know, it's, it's, there are a lot of times where you want to give up where things feel hard and they seem impossible. And I can tell you when we never had insurance, we were like, the whole idea just seemed fictitious. And then one day we had insurance and it was like, wow, we can actually do this. And so there's been many times along the way where it's been really hard. And uh, maybe the question is what, what made you not give up? And, um, you know, I've always held to the belief that if there's a will, there's a way and you don't lose until you give up. 
And so, you know, it, it really does help, as I mentioned, to have useful mental models and thinking tools that can help you brainstorm, you know, think creatively, think differently, figure a way out. There's, there's almost always a way out. It's just not always easy to find. Thank you. Um, so you talked about 10 lessons. Which of them did you learn only through your experience? And I guess a follow-up question is, did you have mentors along the way who gave you a heads up about the lessons? Um, yeah, you know, I think there was, there was, there, I wish there was like a, it was just like, these five were learned this way and these five were learned that way. But the reality is some were learned, you know, the, through the school of hard knocks, others were by, you know, I've, I always tried to be part of the entrepreneurial community to, to meet other founders and entrepreneurs. And, and, you know, you can, when, when there's a, when you have that support group and people are facing similar, but maybe not exactly the same challenges, you can learn from one another and that helps. And, you know, investors and advisors, one of the reasons to take, one of the biggest reasons I'd say to, to take money in a company is that you get connected to people who've learned a lot and been successful and can be very helpful. And, you know, you're not just getting their money, you're getting their advice and their experience. And so you want to, you want to go after both of those. And so also just dialogues with people who'd raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars before inch, you know, if you listen attentively, there's always tips and knowledge that you can get out of any one single conversation. So I would say those are the, uh, the areas and the ways we learned those lessons. Great. Uh, in what city uh, do you have the greatest usage of vehicles? Ha. Um, it's interesting. It depends how you want to define it. Uh, what I find the most fascinating is that uh, the penetration rate we have in o Oslo and in Norway in general is higher than anywhere else in the world, simply because um, it's such a great market for sharing and a very high trust environment, but also because it is the third most experience, expensive country to own a car in. Um, and, uh, and so that would be certainly up there as one of the, the most successful markets for, for car sharing. Uh, where do you plan to expand next? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't want to commit my team on this call, but uh, you know, I'd say today we're very focused, especially coming out of COVID, on growing the markets we're in. We've we've done a ton of expansion in the past three years between the U.S. and Europe, and so our focus today is there's still expansion on the horizon, but it's it's not as aggressive as previously. We're really trying to you know water the plants, water the seeds, and and, and grow the markets that a lot of new markets we've launched in the past one or two years. How do you keep on top of emerging technologies uh, in the car industry? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, how do you do that in any industry? I guess, um, you know, I think we, one of the things to try to encourage, which is an internal cultural thing, is a lot of internal idea and knowledge sharing. Um, so people sharing articles and posting into very public channels and Slack. And that can be very helpful because you're never going to be able to keep on top of everything, but you know, a company of hundreds of people can do a pretty good job. Um, on top of that, you know, try to uh, make time to to read about new technologies, to to keep on track of announcements, and uh, not have too many newsletters, but do subscribe to some things that can you know keep you abreast of changes. Um, and then you know, really think about. You know what are the what are the things that are on the horizon? Whether it's sensor technology or you know different sorts of communications technologies that could take friction out of our model, and then keep an eye open for those things in, in particular. So, I mean, that's what I do. I, but I think probably it's it's also just the, the the culture of the company to absorb and learn is is critically important. You mentioned a number of uh, agreements or partnerships with cities, uh, Los Angeles, Salem, uh, and San Francisco. How challenging is it to uh, develop those partnerships with uh, municipalities in your experience? Um, I think it's, it, it can be very challenging early on because, especially when you're something new and different and not well understood, um, 
you know, people look for patterns on how to work with companies and they're used to working with certain types of companies. And all, all of a sudden along comes this new fangled startup that doesn't fit any of the boxes or molds. And, and that can be challenging, but that's, that's also why getting there, as I mentioned, proactively being an early voice in the conversation, helping to educate and share can get people, you know, get, get that their minds and their brains working around, oh, maybe this is a different way of working together. We need to think a little bit differently about how we partner with a company like this. And then once you get a few of them, you can build on that momentum. So I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of a upfront, you know, edu collaborative education conversation, but uh, we found it to be quite, quite successful. Great. Uh, we have another question here. What is your vision for the future of rideshare? And I don't know if the questioner may have meant car share, but uh, why don't you start with ride share and and, uh, and give us sort of your sense of that broader vision? Yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, we, notwithstanding the 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 blip or the what we're the new normal we're experiencing today, which is you know uh, much lower patterns of usage of ride share because of COVID, um, we've always felt that. You know, when we're thinking of our marketplace, our strength is being a marketplace where we don't own the cars and individuals and, you know, small entrepreneurs can build, uh, you know, sets of one or more cars on the platform and deploy them. And the way we see the world heading is as cars themselves become more like software machines, they are fully connected, much like the PC and the smartphone have been fully and the phone have been fully disrupted by the internet, the car itself will go through the same phase of disruption. And then as you get, you know, more computing and more AI and better sensor technology, cars will be able to move around and be more fluid. And at that point, you know, the, the whole thing gets very interesting. And I, I think you'll see interesting partnerships tend to develop between car share partners, other mobility operators, ride share, um, because there's there's different value being brought. Um, today, we already do that. We partner with Uber, uh, enabling drivers to rent cars through Get Around through an integration that then allows them to drive immediately um, and start earning right away. And I think tech, with technology, you'll see things like that really, really accelerate. Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, I know we're coming up close to close to the time, but we do have a couple, uh, at least one more question. I want to make sure we get in. Um, uh, has anyone tried to buy your company and would you sell it? <laughs> um, yes, people have tried to buy, get around and have, uh, I hear a lot of weird background noise, but uh, the short answer is no, we would, we're not, we were not selling. Okay, so this is Dennis. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Dennis. Okay, so we're now at the close, but thank you for such an amazing uh, story. Uh, the challenges that you had, uh, the zeal that you had, and uh, the hustle that you had. And I think that a lot of people who review this uh, in the months ahead will enjoy your presentation. So I would like to thank you and Andrew uh, for being a part of InventionCon 2020 and giving you a story which was very moving and compelling to me. And hopefully for the people that were listening in, they felt a connectiveness to your story and what it's like to truly be an entrepreneur. So thank you, gentlemen very much. No, thank you very much. It's really an honor to speak here. Thank you. Thank you. So as uh, Mr. Zaid sign off, I'm going to bring a little close to this. Well, this completes day two of Invention Con 2020. Tomorrow we will have more panelists and more interesting topics. Please join us at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time for more InventionCon 2020. Thank you all.